Just a quick content warning before we get started. This episode does contain mentions of racism in Jim Crow South, as well as a relationship with a large age gap between adults. I'd put you in my pocket, push the button through the hole to lock it, hold on to you, you like a treasure, walk across my hand, it'd be a pleasure, you could come with me, you could come with me, oh. Okay, I'm going to try really hard not to roll away from the mic. Okay. Okay. So, hi. Hello. Welcome. Hello. Welcome. Welcome to the Listeners of History. My name is Vega. I'm your history person of interest. Yeah. Yeah. I'm definitely a person of interest. <laughs> both both, both a, a guide and your own you personal would, interest. You would think I would have thought ahead of time about what I was going to say, but I didn't. Yeah. But like, I like, I like it though, because you're, you talk about people of interest and you are yourself a, an interesting person and a person of interest, I believe. Cool. Yeah. So what, what's your name? I'm Issa. Hello. I am Issa. I am an art historian. Um, but not a really, not as in depth of an American historian as Fagan is. And so I will be learning a lot throughout the course of this podcast. Yeah. So I'm, I'm hoping not to just cover American history, but the reality is, uh, that's what I know. So <laughs> that's in, where we are. America is big. There's a lot to cover. So, you I, know, I, I have a, I have a friend who does, who teaches middle Egyptian and, when she talks about that stuff, I'm like completely lost. Like I took uh, classes on the ancient world. Yeah. Like I had to like, like they gave me a, a map in one of my classes and I had to like draw out where all the empires were on the European continent and Northern Africa and the Middle East. And I was like, I I cannot do this. It's so vast. <laughs> it's so vast and it's so complicated and dates are really hard. Like when you're going with that span of dates, it's like, negative 800 to negative a million i saw it's crazy i saw a wild thing yesterday so i've always lived in the like bce before common era and ce common era for sure or like bc and ad but that's obviously fallen out of favor since Mm -hmm. it's in the year of our lord yeah um so i was at a small house museum Mm. i was working with i am hoping to work with them in, in my actual job that pays me money and They took me through their house museum and I asked them if they had any information about uh, the Lenape uh, Uh because Uh that's always my question when I go to these house museums. It's Mm -hmm. like, cool, you've got a piece of George Washington's hair. That's great. (laughs) Uh, And it was actually, it was, it was good. It was, it was about the Lenape pre-colonization, but it was done in conjunction with the local tribe. They, so they had this thing about the Lenape before the Europeans came Mm -hmm. and they used the term BP, hmm. like like the gas company. Uh huh. And I was thinking, what does this mean? And I'm thinking, I don't want to look stupid <laughs> in front of these people that mm. I want to have a, you know, a, a relationship with, right? But also, uh, I don't know what this means. So finally, yeah. I just turned to her and I said, "What does this mean?" Yeah. And she said, "Oh my god, I had the same problem when I joined this museum. I saw this and I thought, I don't want to look stupid at my new job. Oh my goodness." It means before present. And I was like, what? I love the idea of that. Uh Like, I love the not centralizing the supposed year that Jesus Christ was born. Right. However, I don't know what 9,000 BP means. Like, I what? Like, wait, what are they counting as present? Uh, Today, I guess. That's kind of bonkers. Yeah. And I mean, it it works for that stuff because you're talking about like an arrowhead that was made within a thousand year period. You don't have to change it every year. Right. <laughs> um, but, and I mean, I suppose that's the case for a lot of stuff in the ancient world, I right. guess, question mark. I don't really know. Yeah. Sometimes I think that Jewish years actually just like make more sense in general. I mean, I think so. Like 5,000 years ago is a pretty, it's a pretty good like demarcating line of a lot of civilizations. You know what I mean? Like, Jesus was kind of like, in in that time span, the birth of Jesus was kind of random. Like, 
nothing was really ending or starting then. But 5,000 years ago, like, I feel like that era makes a little bit more sense. It might. Again, I don't know anything about the ancient world. Right. So maybe. <laughs> I don't uh, think I do either. I might be just, like, saying random um, stuff. Yeah. <laughs> like, I, I've learned all these things about Richard Nixon since we recorded the last episode. Oh, my goodness. And I'm like, I'm going to be eating my hat. Um, Richard Nixon. I, I stand by nothing that I said. <laughs> and I, immediately after I said so, I stand by nothing of that I said about Richard Nixon. So, but talking about religion, we're talking about religion today. Mm-hmm. And I, I think back to when I was in college, my first semester at college, I took it's American history before 1866. Mm-hmm. That's, and that's the demarcation line in American history, right? It's right. right after the American Civil War. Yeah. And the teacher had us read a book about some cult. And this is from an era in American history where there were just like new religious movements popping up left, right, and center. Yes, yes. And uh, like the the spiritualists who are still around came around that time, the Church of Latter-day Saints. Mm -hmm. There was just like a lot of that sort of movement Mm -hmm. going on. Mm -hmm. And this was a movement, the book was about a movement that didn't last. Uh, And I was 18 (laughs) and very naive. And I came from the suburbs of Philadelphia. And I I love the concentration with which you're trying to open that can of seltzer. <laughs> I, thought, I thought if I opened it slowly and quietly enough, it wouldn't interrupt the recording. Maybe I should have like, I could have like opened it near Just my mic it. so that yeah. you could... Yeah, that, okay. Maybe that's what we need, like a little bit of a of a aesthetic of I am I have now opened a can of two robbers hard seltzer. We are not sponsored by them, but you know, depending on how this episode goes. Yeah, you never know. You never know. Two robbers, I think you're a very good, a very good seltzer company. I got mine from St. Bernardus. It's a triple. Nice. Which is kind of appropriate because we're talking about religious stuff. Wow. So I didn't think about that. I just was like, what is a relatively dark beer that doesn't have like 12% alcohol content? For sure. So I can be, you know, functional. Oh, doesn't or does? Does not. Does not have 12%. No, this would be a very exciting. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> things would get more exciting as we went along. If right. It was 12%. Of course. Uh, so anyway, I'm in this class and I read this book and I went to college at this small uh, liberal arts college in Ohio. And so a lot of people from there were from Ohio or Michigan or Indiana. So I was very much the different one. Mm-hmm. We're talking about this book and I raised my hand and I asked what I thought was not that intense a question, which was, what is the difference between a religion and a cult? Mm. Being 18 and having grown up in an anti-theist home and in a very diverse community where we had a lot of Jewish people, but also a lot of Muslim mm-hmm. people mm-hmm. and a lot of Catholics. And mm-hmm. I suppose there were probably some Protestants in there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I was a little confused because religion wasn't something we talked about a lot in school because there were just so many. So we just didn't talk about it. And the professor s- smiled this smile that I now recognize mm-hmm. uh, as an educator myself <laughs> <laughs> of like, yes, someone, someone asked the thing I wanted someone to ask and the rest of the class started going on about oh well the difference is like in this book the leader is you know there's this there's this you know charismatic leader and I said well who's who's Jesus who's Moses like Mm -hmm. I I, religion has that too Mm. and they said oh well they control what they eat and I was like the laws of kosher the laws of halal Mm -hmm. like Mm -hmm. halal oh my god Ah! (laughs) the laws of halal right and I, I don't do vowels. Um, <laughs> and, you know, and, and it goes on like this. And the point the professor was making was that there isn't a huge difference. But mm-hmm. th- there there actually is. Um, mm-hmm. It's just the word cult is is not a helpful term because yeah. it doesn't actually mean very much. Specific. Yeah. Yeah. So going into this discussion, I want to bring two terms in, which is new religious movement. Mm-hmm which is exactly what it says on the tin. It is a religious movement that is new. So a lot of times people say that like Judaism and Christianity, they've just been, and Islam, they've been around for a very long time. So anything that's a little wacky about it, we just accept Uh because it's been thousands of years. Mm -hmm. And the other term is high control group, Mm -hmm. which is usually what people mean when they say cult. So they're talking about people who 
or have this usually a charismatic leader, but it doesn't have to be that way. Uh, and the group is requires a lot of control in somebody's life to be in the in group, mm -hmm. which can be very damaging. And I want to separate those out because they're very different things. Yeah. So I'm going through all this because I want to talk about uh, a man who thought he was God. Yes. And his name was Father Jealous Divine. Uh-huh. And I stumbled across him because I there there's a big hotel up North Broad Street called the Divine Lorraine. And I was writing a script for a, a tour company. And I thought, I don't actually know anything about this. And so I went on Wikipedia and there wasn't a lot of information there. So I ended up finding this book that was recommended by both academics and also the actual International Peace Mission Movement, which is the name of the of the group that worships Father Divine. Mm -hmm. uh, so I figured that was a good place to start. And this book is called God Comes to America. Amazing. It's by Kenneth Burnham, who in the 1970s, when he wrote this, was a professor of sociology at Temple University. Okay. So a lot of my information comes from this. I also got information from a tiny bit from their website, just because they have a timeline. Uh -huh. But obviously, everything from that I take with a grain of salt. <laughs> to be to be clear, the fa I uh, this is exciting. The the Divine Lorraine Hotel is a very big deal and a very of re of late has been like a controversial issue in Philly. It's this old fancy, from what I understand, kind of wacky looking building that used to be a hotel or was until very, very recently, right? Yeah, so it was sold in, you think I'd have that date ready, uh, but relatively recently, it's condos now. It's condos now. It's because condos now. That's what happens. Yeah, and immediately as this ha like when this happened, my friend messaged me and was like, "Have you ever been to the Divine Lorraine Hotel? It sucks that we can't just like go inside and visit the lobby anymore because it's really gorgeous in the lobby." Well, and I don't know how it is now because I've heard that a lot of it was stripped. That is the worst. News. And I don't know that for sure. Um, <sighs> I that's like sort of a vague okay. recollection I have from when I was doing the. The, the commentary on the hotel itself. Yeah. But Father Divine, actually, the hotel is like way later. Okay. Than Father Divine got stuff. It. But that's got what it. I, that, that, that's what got me on yeah. the Father Divine yeah. track. So Father Divine, Father Jealous Divine, actually, mm -hmm. that's his name. And there is a lot of debate about who this guy was before he became a religious leader. Mm -hmm. So here's what we know. Uh, there is a court document that names him as George Baker. And mm -hmm. various journalists over time have tried to figure out who this George Baker is. But the problem is the name George Baker is not very unique. <sighs> it's such a problem. And for reasons that will become clear as we go through this, journalists, especially white journalists, had a lot of reasons to want to discredit mm -hmm. Father Divine. And so finding the most disreputable George Bakers uh, was... <laughs> The, the name of the game. And so for a long time, nobody really knew where he came from. Uh, there was a historian in the 1990s, though, named Jill Watts, uh, who I discovered this morning. Nice. And I was like, oh, cool. Uh, in the 1990s, she did a like really intense public record search mm -hmm. and was able to find who she says is the correct George Baker. Okay. And he was, according to her, born from a family of formerly enslaved people in Rockville, Maryland. Okay. And he traveled around the country and visited various populist preachers and uh -huh. storefront uh -huh. churches and things like that before he shows up on the scene as mm. Father Divine. But all we get from Father Divine himself, and this is going to be important throughout this, is Father Divine's own words. Mm -hmm. This is something that the International Peace, Peace Mission Movement I, I'm going to get it right. At some point. <laughs> International Peace Mission Movement uh -huh. puts a lot of emphasis on is Father Divine's own words. Okay. So I tried to respect that by putting a lot of his own words in here because they, they're still around. I actually called them this morning and talked to them, oh. which I'll get to later. They were very nice. Uh, so he said that his first marriage was on June 6th, 1882. 
But also, he said in an interview in 1932 that his age was around 52, which, if you do that math, puts his birth around 1880. Mm-hmm. And uh, the movement says he went south in the 1890s to prove that, quote, a man is a man in opposition of Jim Crow. Okay. And those are the only dates we have from an official Father Divine source as far as who he was. And the Kenneth Burnham of this book actually makes the argument that it doesn't really matter Mm. who he was. Because he had so much to say once he was on the movement. Like, it's not like a mystery what his thoughts and feelings about things were. Right. So while as a historian, I'm like, yeah, I want to know, like, where people came from and where they came out of. But honestly... He's pretty clear about what he thinks about yeah. things. He, yeah. he is not quiet. <laughs> so that's that. I figured, though, that's always a question people have. Oh, but he, when sure. he actually appears on the scene is when he settles it, well, a little before 1919. So he was an itinerant preacher, which just means he didn't have, like, a home church. It doesn't mean that he was, like jumping boxcars or whatever. Okay. Like, he just, he doesn't have his own church. Mostly he's based a visiting in, professor. Yeah, he's like a visiting professor. Okay. <laughs> and he was mostly in Harlem. And he decides to settle in Saville, Long Island. Okay. In 1919, which, in a house that was bought by his wife, Panina, who was known as Mother Divine. Okay. Interesting. And he was very upfront about the fact that they bought this house with Panina's wages. Like, there was uh-huh. no, like, weird secret money thing was going to come up a few more times. Yeah. They just said it, like, Panina bought it. Okay. And he really got started with his principles that he would stand by for the rest of his life there in Saville. So I have a quote from him, Mm -hmm. uh, from his time in Saville. And I think it's a good one to start with because it's really puts out there what his central feelings were. Okay. So he said, I do not want anything out here in Saville, but my own unadulterated mind, my own spirit and my own life and my own unadulterated love. Hence, we remained out there and I decided to give practical service to humanity. Okay. So in Saville, they had something of a commune. People would come and they would live there. Uh Anybody could come and get a free meal. Mm -hmm. They could get free clothing. All right. And it was a thing that people did as they'd load up buses from Harlem and go hear what Father Divine had to say, have a free meal. They they had they would have these huge meals together called communions mm. where it was literally that. They were in communion. They yeah. were talking with each other. They were hearing the words of Father Divine. They were eating. So far seems pretty neat. Uh right? Yeah. Like I have, it's 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 this is so so far is a, this is a guy. He is I assume he's some type of spiritual He's religious, but, you know, he's kind of giving people a place to sit and eat and be together and be friends. But is, is you know, what is he, what is he saying? What are his, right. and what, what is he preaching what he was about? saying. Yeah. And this is where, when I read this book the first time, my first thought was, I might have joined this. <laughs> like, if I was uh-huh. running around in the 1930s and 40s, I might sure. have joined this movement. Sure. And I have complicated feelings yeah. about him as we will go through. But the things he had to say were, well, we'll see. But okay. I think they're pretty good. We'll see okay. what you think. So he, he at, well, at first he was putting not very much emphasis on himself. Mm-hmm. At least that's the story. Okay. But then he realized that, quote, the medium is the message and that he was the medium. Mm-hmm. So this is where we start to see a more central idea that Father Divine himself was God. Okay. Or is God, I should say, because Uh that is still the belief. Yeah. And this is one of those things that puts people off. They hear Father Divine is God, and they're like, ooh, this is, mm, Uh mmm, this is weird. Yeah. And just immediately don't think about any of the rest of the movement, which is where I want to put a a pin in the whole Father Divine is God thing. Sure. And go from what, look at what he was actually doing. Okay. One thing he did was he discouraged his followers from reading the Bible or other books in that in that genre in favor of focusing okay. on his own words. Okay. Which, as someone who reads a lot and believes in universality of education, I don't love. Right. But the arguments on the other side is that it was a it was an equalizer. Mm-hmm. So people who had more education weren't any better than anybody else. Okay. That's that's the debate. His home, like I said, became a spiritual and literal home to a lot of people. It was basically a commune. Mm-hmm. 
And unlike a lot of places at the time, it was truly integrated in every possible sense. Mm. It was racially integrated. Mm. It was integrated by wealth, by class, by education. Mm. And like I said, people come up from Harlem to experience this. Mm -hmm. But the people of Sayville were not super into that. So far, it sounds like something that a small... I'm guessing pretty white town. Yes, I was like, <laughs> uh, was like, would be, you know, who are these hippies? Yeah, yeah. as of the last census, it was 95% white. Okay. I can't imagine it was different. Yeah. Then it's this little seas- quiet seaside town mm-hmm. on mm-hmm. Long Island. Mm-hmm. And they were unhappy because there was a lot of traffic and a lot of noise because they would do wow. like parades going down his street. And so this is really popular. Like... Singing and okay. just making a lot of a lot of noise. What is this near West Islip at all? I have no I don't Long know Island is Long big. Island at all. Long Island is huge. <laughs> and I have a lot of family there. I will say that pretty much all parts of it are equally I'm not a huge fan. I'm not, I'll, I'm, I'm not, I'm probably gonna, you know, I, I'm, I'm sorry, Long Island. I'm, I'm not a big fan um, of is. being there. Well, it's near West Islip? Uh, I think so. It, I see an Islip Grange Park. Nearby. Yeah. Well, so my mom moved to Long Island. It's by, when she I'm was not little. gonna say this. Okay. It's by Bayport. Okay. Um, okay. Hmm. So my, my, my mom, Grew up in Queens, and then her family moved to Long Island and found that it was just, like, very exclusive to anyone that was different. Um, And there's a lot of conformity, a lot of embrace of different types of white Americanness, but mostly just white Americanness. Um, which she found very difficult. Anyway, that's that's all I have to say about Long Island for now. <laughs> yeah, my dad grew up on Long Island. Uh-huh. Uh, and I don't know where. People always ask me. And I'm like, yeah. He told me and I do not remember. It's all the same. <laughs> Long Island. I don't know. I it's all Long Island. Like exactly once. I'm sorry. And then Long realized Island. I had to drive through Manhattan to get home and said Oof. never again. Never again. <laughs> never again. So uh, people in Sayville, not on board. Okay. With Father Divine's gatherings. Yeah. And Father Divine said that their problem was really racial discrimination, which probably feels right? relatively accurate. It's the late 1920s. Feels like that could have been that could have been it. That could have been a problem. Yeah, like yeah. I'm sure it was noisy and I'm sure it was causing a lot of traffic issues, but I'm also sure that they probably didn't love a bunch of, you know, black people coming up from Harlem. Nope. Yeah. And coming to their community. Yeah. So he was actually uh, arrested for creating a public nuisance and charged, found guilty on May 25th, 1932. Okay. And was sentenced on June 5th with one year in county jail and $500 fine, which was the maximum possible sentence. Wow. And then two days later, the judge, Judge Smith, falls down dead of a heart attack. (gasps) And an appellate court reverses the ruling. And he only ended up spending 33 days in jail. Okay. So this is seen by a lot of Father Divine's followers as a proof of his divinity. Wow. Wow. Yeah. It's a quite the proof. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but All right. Either way, uh, while the Sayville house is still there, uh, they decided not to keep it as the headquarters. Uh-huh. So they moved down to Harlem in 1932. And the address of it was 20 West 115th Street. And I Google Maps this. And it looks like it's not there anymore. I'm a little, it's it's a little hard to tell. It seems like the side of the street that it would have been on is now one of those horrible, like, Robert Moses tower uh-huh. like, housing project situations. Yeah. Uh, but there is a, a church across the street. So I wonder if Google Maps might be a little confused about yeah. what side of the street's which. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. But it's not there anymore at okay. any rate. Okay. And that's where he continued with his philosophy. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about his whole, his whole philosophy. So at this point it starts to become, it's growing 1930s, 1940s. This is when it's growing. And he would talk about a quote from what he called the old Bible. Okay. Which is what we just call the Bible. Right. Or what Christians would call the old Testament. Uh Uh-huh. I kind of appreciate him not using the term old Testament. Old Bible is cool. Yeah. You know? Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm fine with it. This is a, a <laughs> quote from Jeremiah. 
uh, God is not a God afar off, but God is a God at hand, mm -hmm. which isn't an exact quote of any translation, but that's okay. 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 It, it, the, the principle is there. Okay. And he also said, in reference to Jesus being in heaven, according to the Christian version, if God is up there, how is it God can take care of you and everybody else? Hmm. I think part of why this appeals to me is Judaism is also a very, like, concerned with what's happening yeah. on the earth yeah. religion. Uh, he had very little patience for anything <laughs> that was, like, the great beyond. Mm. So he didn't dress in robes or anything like that. Uh -huh. uh, he wore a suit. Okay. Like, a normal person. Mm-hmm. He uh, said about that, I could do many things to make myself personally appear to be more than what I really am. So far as man would take me to be, I do not wear garbs and robes and whole, whoa, oh my goodness, and a whole lot of foolishness to appear to men as though I am God and still be a man. I would, I would rather appear so far as a physical appearance is concerned, the same as any other man and still be God. Then to be beguiled, firstly, by the beguilation of Eve myself to try to make someone else think I am God by my physical appearance, trying to make myself appear in some way that I am not. This is interesting for a lot of reasons. It's both the it's both concerned with the material world in the way that Protestantism is not some, you know, Protestantism originally comes from i'm gonna make a grand sweeping statement but a lot of protestant sects of christianity are very much kind of wrapped up in the otherworldliness of things um or the otherworldliness of your divine identity or your spiritual identity and so a lot of the time so in, especially during like, the protestant Re reformation and like since then it's been a also this kind of sep like tossing away of external symbols of divinity. So tossing away of, of ornament and symbols of God or paintings of God and all of, all of these things. And it's something that looks really, really fancy. While Catholicism, Judaism, and a lot of other things are a lot more material. There's a lot more, there are a lot more material items that you work with when you worship well it really depends they're both very different catholicism and judaism are extremely different <laughs> and so coming many. in with the hot takes yeah the hot takes they're not the same this has been on my mind a lot for a lot of reasons but anyway what's really interesting is that we are con we are concerned with the here and the now in judaism catholicism is still very material but there is definitely still this you know, otherworldliness. Yeah, well, you're to you're it. trying to ascend into heaven to right. be with with Jesus, right? Yes, but um, which is almost like so you could almost say like Catholicism is in both of these ways the opposite of the Father Divine, um, or goes the other way because so, because they're a concerned with the otherworldliness and they're very showy and very ornate. This is really interesting to me from this conversation because. You'll see this in a lot. I mean, contemporary Jewish spaces in a lot of places in, in the U.S. are not as ornate as they were for a long time. And it's very complicated. This is a whole history we don't have time for right now, Isa. <laughs> but anyway, I am. This is, a, this is a very, very interesting person because he's kind of you can see he's kind of forging his own path in a lot of ways very much so he's very unique and i think it's part unique. of why you don't hear about him that much yeah he doesn't Among fit in reasons. with a larger category no and around this time you're also seeing a lot of african-american religious movements and they are not like father divine they are mm -hmm. very concerned with the world to come uh -huh. and so father divine is is in opposition to that larger movement but there, we, we keep going back. Like, you can hear all these things he talks about, and you're like, okay, that's cool. Like, yeah. we talk, we're worried about whether people have food and shelter. These are important things. But he is running around saying he's God. Sure. And he he was a smart man, so he knew when to be very 
explicit about that and when not to be. Uh So there's this great exchange in this book that goes on for pages and pages and pages Uh of this person who is a Christian came to one of the one of his meetings and started like peppering him with questions. And what's really impressive to me is that he was really seemed to be okay with that. Like he didn't mind Mm -hmm. answering hard questions. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things he says is we are not asking you to believe it is immaterial to me whether you do or not. It is immaterial to me. I say whether you do or not. It is, If you wish to testify, you are welcome to testify. But trying to correct anyone here, we are not bothering about anyone correcting or making corrections. Hmm. If you wish to testify, as I say, you are welcome to testify. And your version is as much right to you as ours is to us. Therefore, we are not bothering whether you believe I am or not. Only if you ask the questions and say you cannot understand and desire to understand. I say I will accuse you to understand if you are sincere god in his own omniscience can reach all sorry i i have a typo and i don't <laughs> god in his omniscience can reach all something in mankind i think all parts of mankind something like that yeah so that's pretty explicit like yeah. i'm god i don't really care what you think huh which also as as a jew i like this like sort of not really not that they don't proselytize at all but these aren't people who are knocking on your door yeah but then, I like that. Yeah. But then he's was in court at one point. A mother had abandoned her child in order to join one of the various communal living situations that okay. existed by that time. Which after this happened, the they put in a requirement that anyone who decided to come live on a commune without their family had to make sure their family was cared for. I think that's really fair. That's a good yeah, requirement. But this was this was the Post. before that requirement is yeah. in there. And the uh, lawyer or whoever was really peppering him, trying to get him to say that he was God. And he dodged it. Uh, he, <laughs> it's probably smart. Yeah. Like I said, he's, he's a smart dude. He's a smart guy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he said, I don't say I am God and I don't say I'm the devil, but I uh, produce God and shake the earth with it. So that's not a no. Right. It's also not a yes. Right. Okay. Yeah. It's 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 a... It's a half baked answer. Oh, if someone asks you if you're right, God, you know, it's uh, like, yeah, I'm not gonna say, but I will say that like we're really good friends, and like essentially, like you could say indirectly, I'm God, but like, yeah, you know, I'm not gonna say it for you. Kind of smart though, yeah, yeah, because usually he wasn't circumspect about that, right? Which honestly, I have respect for. Like, if you're gonna do it. Do it. Do it. Right. Yeah. Uh-huh. Don't don't be weird about it. Yeah. Don't be weird. Don't yeah. Be which I, I appreciate. And yeah. so he, uh, like I said, concerned about bringing heaven to earth. He cares about the world. Okay. And so he didn't view most other Christian denominations. I say other because they did talk about Jesus and so forth. So that's what I'm wondering. Too. It does in its own way exist under the Christian protestant umbrella is just very different yeah i mean there are if you think about it there is a lot of christian sects that or you know christian movements that have had divine people that call themselves divine messengers or the new messiah or god there's so like you know lds outcrops and yeah it happens. it happens and they're definitely still you know christian you know, yeah, depending on who you talk not to. Not going to gatekeep Christianity. Um, we're definitely not going to. We're not going to, but I'm sure there's a quite we a are, many that will. We are nowhere near that gate. Uh, we're just over like on the patch of grass across the way going, yep, there's that gate. Yep. Uh, yep. <laughs> so, he, but he didn't, so he didn't see religion very positively. He said that men try to use religion to keep you in bondage and enslave you. Interesting. But I came and have truly emancipated you. I will not give five cents for a God who could not help me here on the earth. He is only an imagination. It is a false delusion. Trying to make you think you had just as well go ahead and suffer and be enslaved and be lynched and everything else here. And after a while, you are going to heaven and someplace. If God cannot prepare heaven here for you, you are not going anywhere. Okay. I know, right? Throwing down the gauntlet here. For real. With uh, most of Protestant Christianity. And he practiced what he preached. 
Uh, like I said, they have they had sort of communal living situations. By 1942, there were 63 properties that were owned by the church. Wow. But there were far, far more that claimed connection okay. to Father Divine. So those properties that they owned were purchased through the pooling of resources. Mm-hmm. And if you wanted to claim to be part of the International Peace Mission Movement, like if you have a hotel or a store or something like that, you just had to follow certain rules. So you had to pay a living wage. You had to sell your goods at the lowest possible price. Okay. So not, don't don't get excessive profits. Okay. And then there were some things about morality around dress. It was no mixing of the sexes. Mixing of the sexes. Okay, so not the sex. The sexes were still probably there. Very much so. Yeah, okay. In my, in my humble opinion. Yeah. <laughs> not that they were still mixing because the sexes. You, yeah, because you need modest dress. Now, uh-huh. I had always thought of this as modest dress for women because they that's what they talk about the most is like you have to wear like long skirts and stuff. Yeah. But I did read an article by a journalist who went to one of these events when the Divine Lorraine was still open. And he was turned away because his shoes were bright red. Interesting. So really leaning into that like aesthetic mindset. Yeah. And so I I, I don't know what to say about that. There's a lot of things in here where I I am hesitant to make a call because I I can't find the information. I want to learn more. I want to learn more about the red shoes themselves, where he got them, what they looked like, what was, I mean, because, because red shoes, like red shoes, you don't just wake up and just pick up red shoes. You know, and I'm assuming they were not like Converse sneakers, which would be like the most normal version of red shoes. And who knows? You know? It might have been like, this, it could have been. Journalist, I don't know. It's a journalist. So this journalist was. <laughs> Apparently, it didn't occur to him that there might be a modesty requirement, which makes sense because he's a man. Yeah. And doesn't have to grapple yeah. with these things in the yeah. way that people of other genders have to regularly. Yeah. I mean, I'm thinking about Father Divine Lorraine. Just Divine. Divine. Lorraine. Okay. Lorraine. Sorry. Is, is the, it was the name of the hotel That's before the hotel. Father Divine took it over. Got it. Okay. So Father Divine... He is very not about these bright colors, not about external signs of divinity and, you know, external signs and symbols, things that you wear that set you apart from other people as more special. It makes sense growing up when he grew up as somebody that was born of enslaved people and alert and looking around during the Gilded Age because... So many rich people were just doing it up as fancy as they possibly could have. And so this is a huge reason. And this is what I I study for for our listeners. What I do is I study ornaments and minimalism and the different um, that I I usually focus on the ways in which it actually embodied white supremacy in a lot of ways. But you also there's also a lot to be said for people that were genuinely frustrated with rich people being really ornamented and being very showy with their wealth and using decoration as a way of of expressing their wealth you could i could see why somebody like father divine who seems to profess a lot of like equality of a lot of people um would want to would kind of embrace this simpler way of dressing. But it's interesting to me that, and not surprising, that maybe some misogyny could have come in there too. Oh, for sure. Um, And it's right there. (laughs) Yeah. first wife, Panina, Mother Divine. And I I mentioned that there's going to be another Mother Divine. So she referred to herself as his helpmate, which is a terminology you hear in Nowadays, fundamentalist Christian for sure groups. I honestly, I don't know 1920 vibes. Like I, I can't say no. But I don't know either. It's interesting though you say that because about uh, his, you know the rejection of ornament and so forth because he also rejected government assistance. Interesting. Interesting. Yes. Yeah. So to be a like full member of the church, anybody could show up and eat. Anybody can eat. Anybody can get clothes, but if you want to, like, live there and be part of their communal existence, 
you needed to get rid of any debt you had, Mm -hmm. which potentially the church might help you with. Okay. But you're going to get rid of debt and you are going to reject any government assistance. And remember, this is in the 1930s. This is when we're starting to see the beginnings of Social Security. It would have been a great time to get governmental assistance, especially if you were an artist. But definitely not what we're talking about today but like it's a very interesting topic it very much this so. is like this is the golden age this was like you know okay well, maybe is- maybe i'm going a little bit too far <laughs> i date a wpa obsessed person so yes. i've probably taken up a little bit of his propaganda about how great this the 30s were in this one very specific way yes <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 30s, not so great if you're an African-American person. Or a Jew. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Either. A terrible time. Really anywhere. Yeah. Uh, but especially in the South. Yeah. Though he wasn't in the South at this point. He was in New York, and then they eventually moved down to Philadelphia. But. Down South. The, yes. <laughs> Philadelphia. So, we are the South of the Northeast. We really are. Yeah. Uh, there's actually a really great book I haven't read yet called. <laughs> I say it's really great. I haven't read it yet. It has good reviews. It's called Up South. Uh huh. And I'm very excited to read it. Is it about Philly? Yes. <gasps> I love that. Or up south. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. There's also I kind of recommend the book. You know, read it with as many grains of salt as you want. But I kind of recommend. I think it's like something about Mooter, Doctor Mooter's marvelous cabinet of curiosity thing. Have you read he it? Is, I have not. He is a. I was going to say complicated, but I actually don't know how complicated he really is. I don't is. know. I don't know. Uh, I don't think he, I, I, the Mooter, I have not been to the Mooter. Put that out there. I know people have worked there and they seem to have really good exhibits. Yeah. I have uncomfortable feelings oh, about it's... where they got a lot of that stuff. Oh, incredibly uncomfortable. I don't know if he's a D-lister. I'd say he's more of like no. a C-lister, maybe like a B- minus. Well, and I mean, we're taking this in stride, right? Like Father Divine, people who are from Philadelphia sort of vaguely know this guy existed. Right. Because we've got this huge hotel that has Divine Lorraine sitting on the top of yeah. it. Yeah. So, you know, I... I I basically I figure anybody who's not an A lister and is, is fair game okay. for this. He could be an interesting person to talk about. Yeah. Um, but no pressure. But anyway, <laughs> um not at all. I mean but, I want to go to the Mooter. It's it's on my oh, list. It's been on my list for a while. It's long worth time. it to go. I will yeah. say it's worth it to go with like a heavy amount of trigger warnings before and like if you're not comfortable with so many things then just you know you don't have to go and it's you'll be you'll still have just as full of a life um but it's 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 still i will say like if you're cool with seeing some stuff just look up at the website yeah what's, so what's I, there and then part, yeah. and, and then you'll see if you're comfortable going i think it's worth going because it's fascinating i when i went i was not as I don't know. I think I was not as critical of a person when I went. And I was like, wow, look at these bones. Um, yeah, and, and to um, be fair But to today them, I'm kind of like, ooh. They seem to be trying to grapple. Oh, they're grappling. Industry. Oh, they're grappling for so, sure. And so, yeah, I, I that's why I've never gone actually is I'm, I'm a little bit uh, squeamish. Of course. But I did this a bunch of research on the soap lady yeah. And so I kind of want to see it. So anyway, back to Father Divine. For sure. Yeah. No, I forget. Oh, it was just because in the book they talk about um, Philadelphia being this place between the North and the South. And since a very – for a very long time, it's – that's one of the reasons that it becomes a very insular place, especially among high academic society. Um, like it – Dr. Mooter finds it very difficult to break in to, like, the high society world because Philadelphia high society is notoriously insular and does not like outsiders. Um, They love to hang out, but just with each other. And part of the reason is because they don't know how to identify if they're a northern city or a southern city. Yeah, well, there's a whole history of that I could go into. Oh, sure. Sure. We don't have time Uh, for that. It's fascinating. (laughs) So... He so okay. There's this whole system of Father Divine International Peace Mission Movement connected organizations. A lot of them are hotels. A lot of them are sort of like storefront churches. Uh, there's got grocers. You know, it's really whatever. Where is all the money going? That's a great question. Oh no! I, I don't know. So. <laughs> 
the press at the time made a lot of fuss about this. Okay. Where is this money coming from? Uh -huh. How is he feeding all these people? Because that's the thing he's known for mostly in Philadelphia is that he would feed everybody. Like anybody could show up any day to the mm -hmm. Divine Lorraine, pay 10 or 15 cents and get mm -hmm. dinner. Okay. And so the question is like, how how are they paying for all this? And it's not that mysterious. There were a lot of people joining and it was a communal system. And so people who lived and worked within the system were provided the things that they needed. They did live a pretty aesthetic life. Mm -hmm. They would get about $5 a week. But at the same time, if you weren't living within the system, you were expected to be paid a living wage to the extent that Father Divine would tell people like don't accept a lower than living wage yeah. it's not just bad for you it's bad for everyone mm -hmm. he's it's got crazy. some points he's not wrong so but the problem is their treasurer did not keep if the treasurer took kept track of things with like specific numbers we do not have access to that as got far it. as i know i've not been to the father divine library mm -hmm. so it might just be sitting in there for all i know but uh, whenever the treasurer would announce the sort of like quarterly report, it would be all about, oh, we're feeding so many people and we're housing so many people. It wasn't about how much money we brought in versus how much money we put out. Of course. And I should make it clear, none of this was legally connected to Father Divine himself. It was Smart. all connected to the church. That's a good a good business call for and him, for Father Divine. He fully lived within the system of the church. Okay. So he would travel around living at various Father Divine hotels and things like that. Okay. Yeah. I'm just, I've watched enough culty-ish documentary series to know that yeah. they, 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 yeah. That's why they were able to, you know, at least afford to feed everybody. Right. And this is, this is one of those things that I, I don't feel comfortable making a solid statement on. Right. No. Because it does make sense if you've got a bunch of people living communally, mm -hmm. giving their wages or what have you to the group, you can afford a lot of stuff. There are ways but, to do it equitably. But if you're living within the church structure, how easy is it to leave? And I don't know the answer to that. Yeah. I did not find an answer to that. I even went as far as to Google Father Divine Cult mm -hmm. and did not find anything. Interesting. So so there's not a lot of people calling it a cult. No. No, not at all. So some people lived within the system. Some people did not. Mm-hmm. They also would earn money by renting their spaces out mm -hmm. just to whoever, like okay. the same way that hotels do now. Yeah. The difference being that people who came in had to follow certain morality standards. Again, mixing of the sexes, modest dress, that sort of thing. Got it. Could you be gay? Probably not. Yeah. I mean, I didn't find anything specific to that, but I'd be surprised. Yeah. Uh, there's, yeah. That said, we'll get there. Okay. They have a different relationship <laughs> to sex than the average person. Okay. So they founded hotels. Like I said, Divine Lorraine was one of them. It was originally the Lorraine Hotel, which was an upscale hotel. They bought it, and it became the first interracial hotel of its class in the United States. Cool. And like I said, fed people daily, 10 to 15 cent dinners. You didn't have to be anybody. You didn't have to be connected. You could just come and eat. That's pretty neat. And he saw his followers as exemplars. So this idea that they were meant to show a good example of how you should behave. You shouldn't have debt. You shouldn't take government assistance. You should. There's some bootstrap going on here. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Okay. Uh, and how many followers does he have at this point? I don't have a specific number, but okay. it is very small. Okay. The, yeah, so he, it, it, and he said that, if you wait for others to do the right thing, the world will stay with, quote, the other fellow. I love this terminology. The uh -huh. other fellow is the devil. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. I'm a big fan. Yeah. The other fellow. He really, really saw just any sort of religion that wasn't thinking about. I know I keep harping on this, but it is yeah. like so important. Yeah. Any religion that was not focused on the needs of us in the world now mm. as just a he wouldn't have used this terminology but it, it's white supremacy right hey um he wouldn't have used that terminology because they took a very like everyone is equal tack mm -hmm. with the exception of they did say that racial discrimination did exist in the united states mm -hmm. 
I mean, he's he's a black man who lived in the South. Like he's yeah, not he's, stupid. He's aware. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, not that not that that is always a a a uh, the case with everybody, but yeah. But, but I'm claim, pretty. But I'd say that doesn't make sense for him. <laughs> yeah, he claims to have faced lynch mobs and things. So that he, he I'm sure in a very I'm sure specific he's, way. He's quite aware of yeah. the of the problems, and it sounds like he's he's here. He's trying to fix it. I'm I'm being I'm very into the idea of of making your religion something, it, transforming it into action now. Right. Yeah. And he even called out, this is as close as he got as far as the things that I interact with, which, mind you, there's thousands of hours of him talking. <laughs> so I have not heard even a tiny fraction of that. But things he said was like, men such as Mr. Elender, who was a senator who famously filibustered the anti-lynching bill in the mm-hmm. Senate. Mm-hmm just the sort of person that exists sometimes. Mm -hmm. He said that people like him will send missionaries to Africa to teach the people something, to China and to Japan, to teach the people, to teach, sorry, oh my God, (laughs) to China and to Japan to teach the people something and to others they consider unintelligent. But what do they teach them? They teach them to keep God in the imaginary heaven so he cannot come down here to prohibit them from committing crime and legalizing crime. I know, right? Ah, oh, man, he had some words. Like I said, I fully think I would have joined this movie. He was, I would, I would have like gone for dinner probably sometimes, I think. Like, oh, for I sure. wonder like, do you know how the food was? I don't, but I'm assuming it was good. Yeah. People speak of it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, I just like can imagine today this being like, can you imagine if that was here today? Like a couple dollars going to have yeah. dinner. Like, and anybody can come. And it's, like, they're clearly, like, they have so much money that, like, you don't probably don't have to worry about, like, it's for everybody. Yeah. You know, you're not, you're not, yeah. It's, like, that's what, that's what it sounds like. And if you couldn't pay, you could bring, like, raw food as payment. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I don't know exactly how that system worked, but I I know that existed in some places. Yeah. So, Mr. Ellinger, Ellender, Mr. Ellender, the senator, he uh, has an interesting position in the story of the International Peace Mission Movement, much in the way that judge the judge who sentenced Dr. Devine did. Oh, boy. In that he, when he was filibustering, this is back when filibustering actually required standing on the Senate floor mm-hmm. and talking a lot. Don't worry, mm-hmm. he doesn't die. I mean, okay. he eventually. But, okay. Uh, <laughs> presumably. I'm assuming he's not still with us. Um, but not in a dramatic no. way. No, uh, but he had to come up with stuff to talk about. Uh-huh. And this is always the thing with the filibuster where they would like read out of the phone book or something. Yeah. And so he actually read the planks of the International Peace Mission Movement uh-huh. as a way of, of being like, these people are bananas. Oh, interesting. But Father Divine and his followers saw this as as an act of, of Father Divine as God. Uh-huh. Because now the message is getting out. Like it's, it, like it's the... in the congressional record now. Their planks are, at this moment, in the congressional record. And this is the pro-lynching senator? Yes. Wacky, because, like, I don't know. Like, I'm sure their planks are, like, kind of convincing. Yeah, so I have them. Yeah. Oh, and well, great. To... Here they are. Yeah, I have, I have this book with me. I'm not going to just read them. I'm going to kind of, like, summarize them. Sure. Um, but they are the sorts of things you'd expect. So immediate repeal of all laws, ordinances, rules, and regulations, local and national in the United States and elsewhere that have been passed contrary to the spirit and meaning of the Constitution of the United States and its amendments. That feels like what we're supposed to be, like what the U.S. government is trying to do anyway. Like, yeah. That's the point of, yeah, that's, that's fair. Yep. And uh, immediate legislation in every state to make it a crime to discriminate in any public place against an individual on account of race, creed, or color. Uh, abolishing segregated neighborhoods and cities and towns, making mm-hmm. it a crime for landlords or hotels to refuse tenants on such grounds, mm-hmm. abolishing segregated schools and colleges, etc. cetera. Uh, Some good ideas are in there. Yeah, yeah, to make it illegal for a newspaper, magazine, or other publication. To use segregated or slang words referring to race, creed, or color of any individual or group, or write abusively concerning any. Abolish lynching. Mm-hmm. Outlaw members of lynch mobs in all states and countries. Mm-hmm. 
make it a crime for an employer to discharge an employee, even though a subordinate, when even circumstantial evidence can be introduced to show that it was on account of race, creed, or color. Mm. Legislation establishing a maximum fee for all labor union memberships. Uh Uh-huh. Causing them to accept all qualified applicants and give them equal privileges regardless of race, creed, color, or classification. I'm sure you can see a pattern uh-huh. emerging here. Uh-huh. Um, and it goes on like that. And it's it's very much on that. And they also go into some things about religion. Not religion, my God. My goodness. <laughs> <laughs> suffrage and so forth. So they call for equal suffrage for qualified persons. Okay. Because at that time you still had things like the, where you had to, pa- in a lot of Southern states, you had to pass a test to vote. Right. Which was a way of keeping black people from voting. Yeah. Getting rid of the political patronage system, appointment of all civil service employees strictly on their qualifications, doors of all educational institutions be open and free for all, abolishing all educational institutions from books used for educational purposes and such institutions of all references to racial conflicts or differences and national glory through military feats with legislation making a misdemeanor for any educator to teach such in his classes. And so on. Like there's, there's a lot of these. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And so that's in the congressional record. It's pretty cool. And actually you yeah. look back on that. It's like, we, we kind of did some of this. We did some of this and some of it feels, I mean, most of it is, you know, I, oh, all of it. Yeah, cut that out. I would, never mind. It, it's good stuff. It's good stuff, <laughs> yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. It's it's pretty things that we would consider just basic being a good person. Things. Yeah, for sure. For sure. That said, there are a few, put a few little, little, uh, little ticks in there. Sure. So, like I said, really into that, like, bootstraps business. The, you don't blame others for your suffering with the mm-hmm. exception of racial dis- racial discrimination. Mm. Um, property ownership is a sign of spiritual success. Okay. And like I said, no government assistance. And he also felt that if you truly believed in him, you would not get sick. Interesting. And there were miraculous, there were stories of miraculous healings in Sayville, oh. Long Island and so forth. Of course. That said, he said that if you do get sick, First of all, you clearly don't believe in him well enough, but oh boy. given that you're in this situation, go see a doctor. So I, I feel sort of like mixed because it's like, yeah, that's not great. That message is bad. Where does right. I say? That message is not a good message. Right. But at least you're not being encouraged to just pray the cancer away. It's li- It's better than some. It's better than some. I mean, some people really do want you to pray the cancer away and, and that's and I mean, that's just too is, much <laughs> this is this is again this focus on the here and now yeah so in the here and now you clearly don't believe in him well enough but that doesn't mean you need to go die sure and the other thing he gets a lot of criticism for uh mother divine panina died sometime in the 1940s mm-hmm. nobody actually knew she died oh my goodness until that's weird until there's a new mother divine. Oh my gosh. That he marries in 1946. Okay. And this new mother divine, blah, mother divine is named Edna Rose Riching. She is white, blonde, and Canadian. Uh huh. She grew up in the movement and she was 21 years old. And I, I oh, oh, my. So when I first read that, I was like, <laughs> oh boy. Oh boy. How, oh how, boy. how old was uh, Mr. Divine? I mean, he was probably born in 1880. Okay. So. So, like, I don't, can't do math. What year is it? I don't know. It's 1946. So, like, 60. That said. However. However. (laughs) So, that was my first reaction to it. I'm reading this book. I'm like, oh, no. Uh I was really rocking on Father Divine. Like, I was here for him. I was here for it. And then Edna shows up. (laughs) However. Yeah. He was really invested uh-huh. in proving to everyone that they did not have a physical relationship. Interesting. So they had separate living quarters anywhere they traveled to. Was that Pikachu? Yeah. Meow. <laughs> do, you have, do you have thoughts about, about a marriage between a 60-year-old and a 20-year-old? He does. He does. So they had separate living quarters anywhere that they stayed. Okay. And she had like a, I don't know what it was called, but like a, a a woman who was with her at all times. Interesting. 
And at this point, they all started also being really into like celibacy is the way to go for everyone, even if you're married. Interesting. Okay. So supposedly he was celibate. Obviously, okay. I wasn't there. I wasn't in the room. We don't know. We don't know. It, at the very least, they knew that that was, they, that he wasn't running around saying, yeah, a physical relationship in this situation is a great plan. No. So in 1953, this is I, when you said all that stuff about, um, about ornament, I was, I had this this section in my brain. Oh boy. 1953, the Palace Mission Church is presented to okay. him, which is called Woodmont's The Mount of the House of the Lord. It's in Gladwin, uh-huh. which is a suburb of Philadelphia. It's actually in one of the richest zip codes in the area. Yeah. And it is a literal castle. Wow. It is a castle. Oh boy. And it is, by the way, still around. And you can tour it. <gasps> And I wanted to go out there, but it's not open in the winter. Okay. And it is winter time right now when we record this. So I I have a scheme to head out there at some point. And after a while, so at this point, things are things are kind of petering out. Because you know when you when you don't allow people to have sex, they don't have children. Yeah. So you have to wait. So this is yeah, don't have sex including to not have kids. Correct. That's you know, you know, it's only gonna last for so long. Yes. And they have a great message, so they do still keep bringing new people in, Mm -hmm. but at a slower rate. Okay. Especially because Father Divine is very much a charismatic leader. Sure. And by 1960, he's no longer going to events because he's old. He's an old guy. Old dude. Mm -hmm. He does die in 1965, Mm -hmm. and he uh, is enshrined there at Woodmont. And his death announcement, I think, is very interesting because mm-hmm. when you have someone who's meant to be God and then they die, it's a yeah. little problematic. It for is a always a problem. Movement. Yeah, because they're not supposed to die. Yeah, like there's some some sects of Judaism that have claimed that their leader is the Messiah and oh, then yeah. they die, and it's a struggle. It, oof, yeah, it's a it's a PR problem for sure. Yes. Yeah. So here's how they handled it. Which okay. I think it was really smart. Uh huh. Uh, this is from the New Day, which is their newspaper that they printed for the vast majority of their existence. Um, I believe they stopped it in the 80s. And this is what they said. The hour had come. It was 2.30 Friday morning, September 10th, 1965. The place was Woodmont, the mount of the house of the Lord. Out of the stillness of the night came a call that summoned those closest to Father Divine personally. His immediate staff to his side, Mother Divine, was already there. Our beloved Lord and Savior, Father Divine, had seen fitting and necessary to throw off the precious, holy little body that millions all over the world love and adore more than life itself. It was now their holy pleasure as followers of the Lamb to rest in his divine will, knowing by deep conviction and spiritual revelation the wisdom of his great plan and purpose for the universe. Wow. So that's his death announcement. Wow. And Pikachu was, you know, of course, really just um, <clears throat> demonstrating that divine, that call that they heard throughout the house. Yes. Of course. Yes. So there was a, they, they put it in a shrine, 1968. Okay. And a lot of people thought this was going to be the end of it, and it wasn't. Mother <laughs> Divine took over mm. at that point. And she mostly really leaned on his words, and they still do. They're still in existence. Uh Just much smaller than they used to be. Mother Divine also oversaw selling off of properties because as they got smaller, they couldn't maintain the properties anymore. Yeah. So the Divine Lorraine Hotel, for example. she Is that an example of them selling today? Okay. Well, and it sat empty for a while. Yeah. But now now it's condos. Yay. Yay. Uh, So Mother Divine, she was... She, but they still, they still, people still could still come to Philadelphia for communal meals when the Divine Lorraine was still there yeah. as, as part of the movement. People could go there. And until 2020, people could and would go to Woodmont for communal meals. Hmm. Wow, that's really recent. Yeah. Mother Divine didn't die until 2017. Wow. Yes. And the 2020 thing, that's because of COVID. Okay. So this is why I called them because uh-huh. I was trying to find any evidence that they were still having communal meals or not. So yeah. you can go visit and go to the library and museum about Father Divine and you can get a tour uh-huh. of the house. Okay. They're very particular about wearing masks, which I think okay. is interesting given Father Divine's 
opinions on faith and illness. Sure. That said, I am always pro anybody who's going to be pro mask. Me too. So no criticism there. Yeah. I, I called them this morning and yeah. I asked them if they still had their communal meals. Mm-hmm. And she said, unfortunately, no, because of COVID. Okay. So who knows if that will. Yeah. If that'll come back. Come back. Because yeah. the fact of the matter is their following is not young. Yeah. Yeah. And they are, you know, people who are more at risk. Yeah. With COVID. They're, um, all, they're a little older. But Mother Divine really held it together. She had a charismatic leadership of her own. And interestingly, she actually, in a lot of ways, saved the lives of every member of the International Peace Mission Movement. Huh. And she did that by stopping Jim Jones from taking over. Wow. So Jim Jones was a member of the International Peace Mission Movement. And oh, a lot wow. of the tenants from the People's Temple were like lifted from Father Divine's principles. Mm-hmm. And he claimed to be the reincarnation of Father Divine. <sighs> and Mother Divine was like, absolutely not. Yeah. This is not what's happening here. Love it. And some people would argue that that was because she wanted to keep power. I'd like to think that she had an idea that he was a problem. Sure. But at any rate, they would literally send spies to each other's like meetings oh my and goodness. stuff. Like it was intense. Yeah. And it did not stop until Jonestown. Which, for those who don't know, that's when Jim Jones and his followers uh, engaged in a mass suicide. So, good job. Yeah. yeah good, job, good, that, good call. Good call on that one. And as far as I can tell, they're really just kind of chugging along. Um, they have a Facebook page. They have a wow. YouTube account. Wow. And it's all entirely just quotes from Father Divine. Wow. It's like I said, they put a lot of emphasis on his words. Interesting. So, it's like... It's a pretty intense belief to believe that he was God, but, you know, could it be worse? It could be a lot worse than this. Yeah. In terms of, in, in terms of new religious movements, there are so many worse ones out there. Right. And so I go back and forth on Father Divine. Mm-hmm. Because obviously there's things I don't agree with. Right. I, I am not a fan of the, like, reject government assistance yep. stuff. However, I do, I, I, I can't argue with a lot of his words. Yeah. Which at the end of the day, that's what the International Peace Mission Movement is focused on is his words. Yeah. And the only words I really have a problem with are the I am God mm-hmm. and reject government assistance. Yeah. The rest of it. I mean, I, I can't argue with it. Can't argue with it. And no, so, he had some pretty good ideas. Yeah. And so I think this is an important example when we talk about new religious movements, because mm-hmm. people have started using the term new religious movement as a just drop in word for cult. Right. And I don't think that's fair. Yeah. And I, you know, Moses was also claiming to have talked to God. Mm-hmm. And uh, here we are. Yeah, here we are. A bunch of Jews just hanging out, talking about some other guy claiming to be God. <laughs> it's true. Who are we to judge? Who are we to judge? <laughs> that one just happened a long time ago. Yes. <laughs> so I, I do hope to make my way out to their headquarters. Would, yeah, that sounds fascinating. Yeah, I, I do want to make it out there. And yes, Pikachu, I'm sorry. So anyway, Pikachu says it's dinner time. It's dinner time. So we're going to close this up. Thank you so much for listening to D-Listers of History. If you enjoyed yourself, be sure to subscribe and drop us a review on whatever platform you listen on. A huge thank you to April Keys for the use of the song Misfit from her album Mountain View. You can find her on all the social media platforms. You can find us on Instagram, Facebook, and sometimes TikTok at D-Listers of History. No hyphens. A big shout out to the folks supporting us on Patreon. If you want to support us and get access to all sorts of exclusive content, become a patron of this program. All of this and more can be found on our website, delistersofhistory.com. Again, no hyphens, just smush that sucker together like a German compound word. And now for an episode-relevant audio drop. Which was the same commission to confess mankind of God's actual presence for which we rejoice and have personified in the presence of the children of man.